Enter, rejoice, and log in. One more time. Enter, rejoice, and log in. Today will be a joyful day. Enter, rejoice, and log in. We light this flame as a symbol of new life enlightening our way, as a symbol of the warmth in every human heart. Let, Let the, the lighting, lighting of this flame rekindle in us the inner light of hope, of peace, of love. May we share that light with all people. Good morning. I am Marie Luna, your Director of Congregational Life. Thank you for welcoming us into your home today. It is good to be together, even in this online format. If you are joining us from another Unitarian Universalist congregation, welcome. If this is your first time visiting the fellowship, I want to extend you a special welcome. I hope you learn more about our fellowship and get connected here. I would be happy to help you do so. I invite you to join me after this service for a special newcomer breakout. More information on that will be at the end of the service, or please send me an email. Thank you. Today's service is being led and supported by Reverend Christina Leon Tracy, our senior minister, Reverend Leah Angiri, our associate minister, Ali Peters, our intern minister, Mark Marnaka, our lay worship leader, Kim Hartman, our director of religious education, Steve Seek, our music director, our wonderful musicians and singers, and Adam Robinson, our AV tech. Thank you to everyone who has made this morning service possible. This year, we are focusing on growing resilience. We're digging in to what it means to grow ourselves and our community to be sources of life, even when things get tough. Right now, we are focusing on balance. It can feel hard in tumultuous times to find balance, but our goal will be to explore ways to create balance together. It is now time to settle in to your space wherever you are, to take a deep breath and be present to this time together, even from afar. Hi everyone. Today, Ali and I have a story to share with you about a time when one friend hurt another friend even though they didn't mean to. It can be so hard when we get hurt by someone that we care about and who we thought cared about us. There are so many different ways that this story could go and every situation is different. This is just one story that we offer to you this morning. <laughs> wait, 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 here's another one. Why should you never rob a bank with a pig? I don't know. I don't know. They always squeal. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Where do flying pigs go to school? I, I don't know. I don't know. Where? <laughs> <laughs> Why are pigs awful basketball players? I give. I give. Why? They always hog the ball. Stop. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 
What you doing, Polly? Are you okay? Oh my gosh, did you hear Monty the Mouse telling all of those pig jokes? I can't believe him. How insensitive. I'm never going to talk to him again. And I'm going to post something on my Twitter so everyone else knows how much of a jerk he is. Wow. I'm sorry that that happened. I bet that must feel awful to hear someone else telling such hurtful jokes about us. Especially since you and Monty have been such good friends. Well, we're not going to be friends anymore. I can tell you that. You know, hmm, I think there's probably a bunch of different ways you can respond in this situation. And you have to pick what's right for you. You have to honor your own truth here. I'd suggest, though, that you pause before posting anything, just at least to consider your options. Well, I'm just so angry, and I need everyone to know that telling jokes like that hurts, and it's really wrong. Good point. You're right. It does hurt. Let's think about what you could do. You could post that angry tweet. And then what would happen if you do that? Well, then everyone would know that telling jokes like that is bad. And they would know what a terrible mouse Monty is. (sighs) Oh, so, so you think Monty the mouse is terrible? Well, I didn't, I didn't until I heard him telling those jokes. That's tough. So if you post that, then everyone will think Monty's terrible and I guess he'll have no friends. Well, yeah, I guess. But maybe he doesn't deserve friends anymore. Oh, Uh, well, but if he has no friends, then who's going to let him know when he's doing something hurtful, like like telling pig jokes? Well. Yeah, I guess I didn't think about it in that way. Do you think Monty meant to be hurtful? You know, I don't know what his intention was, but his impact was definitely hurtful. Oh, that's important. How we impact each other is always what matters. Does Monty know that his jokes hurt you? Yeah, Yeah, I don't know. Well... I can't tell you what to do. You might feel so hurt that you feel like you can't talk to Monty about this. And and that's fine. But if you do feel up to talking with him, it, it could be an opportunity for him to learn how he can do better. Although I know that that conversation might be kind of hard. So it's really up to you. Hmm. Well, those are some good points. I'm going to have to think about it. Hey, Monty, can I talk to you about something for a minute? Yeah, sure, Polly. What's up? Well, I heard you telling pig jokes to the other mice yesterday. (laughs) Yeah, weren't they really funny? (laughs) Actually, I don't think they were. When I heard you telling those jokes, it really hurt my feelings. You know, I'm a pig, and it was like you were making fun of me. No, 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 Polly, you don't get it. Those jokes weren't about you. Well, actually, they were about me because I'm a pig. You might not have meant to hurt me, but you did. Oh, huh. Well, I thought that a joke was just a joke, and and I thought that everyone would think it was funny. I I didn't mean to hurt you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm I'm really glad you told me. Now I'm I'm gonna think more about the impact of what I say, even if I just think it's some funny joke. Thanks for listening to me. You know, I still feel kind of mad at you, but. I do also feel hurt, and I hope that if I ever say anything that hurts you, that you're going to tell me too. That's a deal. I'm really glad you told me about this. Our friendship is so much more important to me than any silly joke, so I'm going to try and do better. In this story, Polly the pig chose to call her friend in and hold him accountable in a loving way 
rather than canceling him on social media. Calling someone in can be a loving response to hurt and a way to keep our relationships with each other strong. There are times though, when calling someone in that way might not be the best option or might not be possible for us. May we all consider each individual situation that comes up in life to find what a loving and just response might be. Our first reading today is from Reverend Paige Getty from the book, The Seven Principles in Word and Worship. This is the reflection on the fourth principle. As responsible religious seekers, we recognize that we are privileged to be free, to have resources to pursue life beyond mere survival, to continually search for truth and meaning, to exist beyond bounds of dogma and oppression, and to wrestle freely with truth and meaning as they evolve. This privilege calls us not to be isolated and self-centered, believing that our own single perspective trumps all others, but rather to be humble, to be open to the great mysteries of truth and meaning that life offers. And those mysteries may speak to us through our own intuition and experience, but also through tradition, community, conflict, nature, and relationships. As a faith tradition, Unitarian Universalism makes sacred the right and responsibility to engage in this free and responsible quest as an act of religious devotion. Institutionally, we have left open the questions of what truth and meaning are, acknowledging that mindful people will, in every age, discover new insights. Our second reading this morning comes from the online piece entitled Cancel Culture, The Good, The Bad, and Its Impact on Social Change by Alexandra de Amor. It's important to acknowledge First and foremost, the good that has come from cancel culture. In the New York Times research piece about cancel culture, Lisa Nakamura, professor at the University of Michigan, who studies the intersection of digital media with race, gender, and sexuality, defines cancel culture as a cultural boycott. It's an agreement not to amplify, signal boost, or give money to. Essentially, when someone has said or done problematic things, either in the present or the past, the people have the ability to stop supporting them and their work by effectively canceling them. Cancel culture has been incredibly effective at combating sexism, 
racism and other types of abuse and harmful wrongdoing. It's held people accountable for their actions in ways that weren't possible in the past. Political writer Amanda Marcotte posed the question in a piece she wrote for Salon. If we had a justice culture, would we even need to worry about cancel culture? When we are unable to rely on a justice system to punish those who have committed a crime or expressed racist and sexist behaviors, we the people turn to cancel culture for retribution. Take Harvey Weinstein, for example, the once mega producer who was able to dodge lawsuits and sexual abuse accusations for over 25 years. It wasn't until public outcry and pressure through social media, through the hashtag MeToo movement, that the police finally got involved. In 2018, Weinstein was charged with rape and several other counts of sexual abuse. In this case, cancel culture impacted justice culture. Calling out problematic, deeply hurtful, and damaging behavior can positively impact our society. By being able to express moral outrage, cancel culture has allowed for power dynamics to start to change. The people in power are still mostly white, male, and rich. But people of color, women, and other marginalized folks are finally able to take a seat at the table, taking hold of their power with every tweet. Now, Amor writes, I believe in its positive impact, but cancel culture can also get ugly. And it isn't as black and white as I have just possibly portrayed it to be. We have to allow individuals to learn from their mistakes. Woke bashing individuals who are willing to learn and have a desire to be an ally to marginalized communities doesn't serve the collective pursuit of equality. It only causes alienation and shame. I believe we need to push for critical thinking, encouraging people to read beyond the headlines and potential media manipulation. In a world where we repost moral outrage without the necessary due diligence, it's important we read between the lines before effectively canceling someone. As actress Jamila Jamil tweeted a few months ago, nobody is born perfectly woke. And we shouldn't expect people to be. Wokeness is a continuous process of learning and unlearning. It's about showing up even when it makes you uncomfortable. It's about turning fear of criticism into impactful dialogue and actionable change. I love that Jamil calls herself a feminist in progress. To me, that term represents wanting to create a better and more equal world while acknowledging progress and the mistakes that will be made along the way. Wild roads, 
guard we ere their sacred embers carried in our minds and hearts. I have spent much time the past several weeks reflecting upon the fourth principle. While it is an affirmation and an endorsement of a certain mode of spiritual searching, it speaks also of, of powerful tensions and dualities. I found it useful myself to apply this principle to diverse life, family, political, and cultural situations, all of which call upon us to weave together truth and meaning and to balance the powers of freedom and responsibility. I remember fondly going camping with our children and sometimes their friends. Responsibility ranged from taking along enough eggs, sausage, bread, syrup, etc., for the picnic table cooking and serving of brunch. And then the designation of cleanup duties with sufficient freedom of choice granted to the participants. These trips to Southern Illinois included the freely made decisions about where to hike or whether to play at the beach or blending the teens and the grade schoolers and the sharing of responsibility for safety and positive ties among those age groups. When at a family campground or cabin, the fusion of, friend, of freedom and responsibility helped make the moment more powerful and enjoyable for adults and also the young ones. I recall this vividly as a child traveling with my family to Wisconsin for the summer, along with how much I still value my memories of being a parent on such travels. Freedom and responsibility overlap to create a deep form of health one that blends order and spontaneity, play and work, risks and safety. When these overlaps do not occur in a family, adverse consequences are far more likely. When I was in psychology practice, I took family histories from teen or adult clients. And when I took that history, I ascertained who were the people, family or neighbors, who could be trusted to give protection as well as affection. Recent research has found that youth with adverse childhood experiences have fewer adverse consequences of that in later life when they report having more trusted adults around them in childhood. Again, the positive blending of responsibility and freedom between children and adults. It is likely also the truth of a difficult childhood may, may be difficult to face and explore later in life, yet its meaning and its healing may emerge only when the stories and wounds in the family among generations are found after a shared search that is free and responsible. Thus, this principle speaks not just about searches, but also pilgrimages, explorations, and deep appreciations of persons, important yet flawed. In similar fashion, our flawed nation and its historical tragedies require us to exert our freedom of reflection and investigation to grasp the deep truths of history and their meanings today, freshly appreciated. And ultimately, this may facilitate our freely assuming responsibility for doing what we can to heal old wounds and awakening as a nation to revive what is injured among those who are underprivileged and injured by past abuse, futility, and denigration. As the philosopher George Santayana wrote, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We must remain free to know and remember the truth of the past and how its meaning will underscore our responsibility for amends and for not repeating moral errors again and again. We 
must have the resolve to be free to take the responsibility that will keep our greater family of nation and of household safe by the proper use of facts to find the deep meanings that can heal. Be well, be good. When I first learned about the seven UU principles as a new Unitarian Universalist in college, I learned about them using this image. The archway is made up of seven pieces. The pillars are the first and seventh principle, which we often call on easily and readily when explaining our faith, inherent worth and dignity, and to the interconnectedness of all things. But the fourth principle, the fourth principle is the keystone. It's the center. Our fourth Unitarian Universalist principle states that we covenant to affirm and promote a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. I love the keystone-like balance that is repeated in this principle. When we talk about the fourth principle, we often talk about the word search, but I want to hold the two halves of that search in balance, free and responsible, truth and meaning. Next week, Reverend Leah will explore the second half of that balancing act, truth and meaning. And we will focus today on the free and responsible part. So what does it mean in our faith tradition to be free? The 20th century Unitarian Universalist theologian, professor, and minister, James Luther Adams, wrote about what he named the five smooth stones of religious liberalism. Each of these stones are a metaphor for the simple and unassuming power of our faith in the spirit of the stones used by David against the giant Goliath in the Hebrew scriptures. One of these stones is all relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not coercion. I'll say that again. All relations between persons ought ideally to rest on mutual free consent and not coercion. Another way to say that is you don't have to be here. We are in community freely. No one is or should be forcing you. We are mutually and freely choosing to be together. Additionally, as Unitarian Universalists, we have another kind of freedom. We have freedom of belief. We aren't going to tell you what to believe. And while that freedom feels like a relief to many, it can also feel heavy and hard at times, especially when things feel uncertain. But that's how freedom works. And then the balance. Freedom in our fourth principle is balanced with responsibility. In terms of belief, people often say that Unitarian Universalists can believe whatever we want. That's our freedom talking. But I would argue that that's not exactly true. We can't believe whatever we want. We must temper our beliefs to agree with our own experiences, with the rhythms of nature, with the teachings of science and the great prophets of peace, our beliefs, in other words, are informed by our six sources of inspiration, which we talked about last week on Easter. We don't believe what we want. We believe what we must. And in the free communities that we form, we are accountable to each other. This accountability gives us strength 
It provides another source for inspiration and belief. My own experiences might differ from yours, but if we are in accountable relationship, my view of the world will expand and shift because of that accountability. Freedom. We can do what we want, say what we want, but that means that other people are also free to have their own reactions. This means there might be consequences for our actions. It means accountability is freedom tempered by responsibility. And as I've been thinking about all of this, it makes me think of that term that's coming up a lot in popular culture, cancel culture. Cancel culture is the idea that there is a widespread use of cancellation or social media backlash that shuns people because of their beliefs or actions. A lot of times this cancellation is superficial. Within a few days, the person is back up and at it again. But in some cases, this cancellation has happened with severe consequences. Adrian Marie Brown, who is the author of Emergent Strategy, Pleasure Activism, and other books on the power of community activism and movement building, has a new short book out exploring cancel culture entitled, We Will Not Cancel Us. She uses the term cancellation, cancel culture, and call outs interchangeably. Brown writes, quote, call outs feel most powerful when they are used with their tactical intention. For those with less positional, political, economic, or other power to demand accountability to stop harm and abuse. She also writes, callouts have a long history as a brilliant strategy for marginalized people to stand up to those with power. Callouts or cancellations have been a way to bring collective power to bear on corporations, institutions, and abusers on behalf of individuals or oppressed people who cannot stop injustice and get accountability on their own. There are those who are out of alignment with life, consent, dignity, and humanity who will only stop when a light is shined onto their inhumane behavior." End quote. This happened with Harvey Weinstein, as we read earlier, and R. Kelly with the hashtag MeToo movement. The justice system was finally forced to act when public pressure got too heavy. It happened to a lesser degree with the hashtag and boycott Oscars So White, which was begun by April Rain and popularized by Will and Jada Pinkett Smith and other actors. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences still has a long way to go to make meaningful change. But within a few years, there has been an 8% improvement in racial and gender diversity. Additionally, the removal of Confederate monuments around the country have been the result of public pressure. As Adrienne Marie Brown states, cancellation can be a powerful tactic and have a long history as a brilliant strategy when it is used as intent. But there are two ways that people are using the term cancellation or cancel culture. One is the way that Adrienne Marie Brown or Alexandra de Amour talks about it in the reading we heard earlier. True consequences for true harmful behavior. The collective response of harmed people bringing consequences to bear on those who have done harm. But another way that that term is being used is by those who, it, who claim it is about political correctness, creating a groupthink, 
or squashing free speech. There is some claim that any change to social norms is cancellation. For example, recently, the family of Dr. Seuss, Theodore Seuss Geisel, removed a handful of his many books from print. This happens all the time in publishing, and many, many more of his books are still indeed in print, including the beloved ones like Cat in the Hat, Oh, the Things You Can Think, The Lorax, and more. But the few books that were pulled from publication contained content that many people had perceived and named as racist. Seems like a good idea. Why keep books on the shelves that have racist caricatures in them? Times change. We learn and grow. Nobody has canceled Dr. Seuss. His family and publishers have chosen to use their freedom of publication with responsibility. That's all, and that's a good thing. But there is a shadow side to cancellation, to cancel culture. It can be a quick knee-jerk reaction to any perceived disagreement, and it is heightened by social media, and it has the capacity to reduce people to their one biggest mistake. It avoids any true accountability or connection that could allow for growth and responsibility. Adrienne Marie Brown states when talking about this kind of cancellation, the kind happening in community among people who are working toward the same goals, who are quick to cancel each other for a misstep or a disagreement in philosophy for not being woke enough. She says, quote, we have to recognize that we are on dangerous territory that is not aligned with a transformative justice vision when we meet out punishments in place of consequences, or when we issue consequences with no inquiry, no questions, no acceptance of accountability, no process, no time for learning and unlearning that's necessary for authentic change, just instant and often unsatisfactory consequences, end quote. She says call-outs or cancellations are a way of pulling an emergency break. But call-outs need to be used specifically for harm and abuse. And within movement spaces should be deployed as a last option. She says transform transformative justice Transformative justice is relational. It happens at the scale of communities. And call-outs now happen at the scale of viral threads among strangers. Trevor Noah, the co comedian and host of The Daily Show, discusses this tension and his problem with cancel culture in a conversation that he had on the radio show the Breakfast Club. Here's a clip from that conversation.
I want to thank our intern minister, Allie, for sharing that clip with me. She used it in the Wellspring class that she taught last fall on calling in versus calling out. Trevor Noah talks in that clip about the human response to being excluded when, as he says, your back is against the wall and it feels like people have ganged up on you. The response to that is not remorse or transformation. The response is aggression. Adrienne Marie Brown says in her book, quote, if the kind of callouts that are sweeping online spaces and spilling into real life actually stopped harm, resolved conflict, ended supremacy, transformed people, I'd be a call-out machine. I love functional tools. But what happens more often is that people step back. They leave altogether. Or they double down and return with even more egregious acts of flagrant harm. If the goal is transformation, and I do hope it is for all of us, if the goal is a changed heart, a continuous life journey of growth and learning and improvement, then there must be accountability. As I think about what it means to abide together in a free and responsible faith, the word accountability repeats over and over in my mind. Our ancestors had another word. They called it covenant. Covenant is about relationship. It's more than just friendship or like-mindedness. Covenant is about what James Luther Adams said, mutual consent and not coercion. It is also about being bound in relationship, bound together in relationship, commitment, both across our human plane of existence, but also connected together vertically to our highest values or that which we aspire to, that which some people call God. We must be free, but also accountable which happens best when we come together in community. The truth is in our capitalist, materialist society, we often are taught to prioritize comfort, not transformation. Even when we come to the fellowship, it's easy to forget that the purpose of our community is not to give each other exactly what we want. The purpose is to meet each of us where we are on our journey, but not let us stay there. The purpose is to help us each transform, deepen, and grow, and that is rarely comfortable. Our fourth Unitarian Universalist principle calls us to freedom and responsibility, to accountability, to commit to calling each other in rather than out when we need to learn and grow. And when we receive that feedback, when we are called back in, that something we said or did cause harm, this principle, this principle of responsibility calls us to a practice of humility and apology, not defensiveness. Now, I realize this isn't always easy. It's never comfortable, but it is truly what will allow us to continue in covenant together with freedom and responsibility. Amen. And may it be so. Oh
Sharing our individual joys and concerns helps us collectively to grow resilience. Connection is different in a virtual world, but it is still available. So if you'd like to share whatever is on your mind or your heart right now, please feel free to type your joy or your concern into our chat box. That way we can hold space for and with you as we worship. If you'd like your news included in the weekly care email that goes out this afternoon to members and friends who have asked to receive it, then go ahead and email Reverend Leah or fill out our website form. We will drop that information into the chat box as well. And after the service, A member of our care team will host a breakout room for anyone who would like to process their life's joy or concern or just anything especially tender that might be present with you in general or today. You'll hear more instructions during our closing words. All are warmly invited. And we always welcome you to be in touch if you would like to connect with myself or any of our ministers or a member of our wonderful care team. Now, let us breathe into this shared silence and then join in our sung response. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. And we have found a need to be together. We have our hearts to give. We have our thoughts to receive. And we believe that sharing is an answer. Greetings. We are closing stewardship season with unpleasant news. We need a second to ask. This is my last pledge campaign, so I want to announce it for two reasons. The first is it gives me a last official chance to say thank you to all of you who give. 
I am in awe of the generosity I experience here. Thank you. The second reason is that I would like to make three observations about fellowship finances. One, the small handful of top givers can't just keep giving more. It gives too few too much power. We need people at the comfortable bottom or middle of their capacity to move up. If you give a hundred bucks every year and can afford the coffee shop every few weeks, I ask you to prioritize giving $200 annually. If you pledge $600 and can take a vacation most years that costs, say, $1,000, could you double your pledge? If you give $3,000 and winter in warmer climates, own a cabin, maybe travel internationally, consider giving $5,000. My examples and amounts might be wrong for you, but there is deep, untapped giving potential in this congregation. How can you help transform that culture? Two, it's tempting to imagine we can get by with less money if we get more volunteers. The reality is that this is a congregation that already pitches in impressively. Volunteerism actually keeps pace with professional staffing levels. Staff and volunteers are parts of the same. The more we resource one, the more the other increases. Don't believe me? Lay off some staff. Watch what happens. My third point, it's just my story. I want you to know that since my early 20s, I've given away about 10% of my income, with the exception that in graduate school, I tithed on money I earned, but not on student loans. Some years, it's been a little less, like when extended family had a particular need. Some years, it's been a little more, like when I paid off my used car and celebrated by joining the Fellowship's Acorn Society with a one-time $500 gift to the endowment. For the upcoming year, my partner Amy and I pledge $2,100. At the same time, we're decreasing our income to move somewhere way more expensive. Home ownership is likely out of reach. I'm scared. That makes me feel stingy. But it will be the last year I get the honor of being a fellowship supporter. And I take seriously that obligation. After November, I will resign as member and minister. I won't pledge again. My ask, my hope, is that quite a few of you who pledge less than my $2,100 will take over my financial commitment. Could you add some zeros to your current or first pledge? If so, I suspect you would find it meaningful. I promise to end on a cheerful note. But first, I'm going to complain. Right now, we are 30.8% short of our goal budget of $836,049. And we just got word that our insurance premiums will increase much more than we anticipated. I'll drop a few more financial facts into the chat now, and we will expand on them in a follow-up email this week. I hope it inspires you to act. The most demoralizing frustrating thing about this ministry is that every year we exhaust ourselves to barely make a bare bones budget. I am tired of having to celebrate that I still don't have dental. We still can't afford a bookkeeper. There's no way to launch exciting new programs, but I guess hooray because my salary wasn't slashed. 
The cynical part of me says that the fellowship doesn't actually want a mission of welcoming, growing, and leading. So let's be honest. Let's shrink down to something tiny that costs less and demands nothing. But I have been serving a bright, warm, caring, brave congregation for almost a decade. So I cannot give in to cynicism. You make it impossible. I know that we, that you, can realize a creative, life-changing, world-transforming mission and vision. There is already so much evidence, so many glimmers of this. But we can't do it at this budget. The choice is yours. As we come to the end of our service, we will extinguish our chalice flame, even as we still hold its light in our hearts. Please join me in our words. As we extinguish this flame, let us go our ways with hope in our hearts, with our spirits renewed, and with a deeper understanding of life's mystery. Let us carry the light of compassion and commitment to build a better world. After our closing words, we will be having small breakout groups for conversation. In a moment, we will hear a short postlude song. If you do not want to participate in any small group conversations, then please use that postlude time to log off and leave this Zoom meeting. If you choose to stay, you will be invited to choose your own breakout room on Zoom. One option will be for newcomers to join our Director of Congregational Life, Marie Luna, in a special newcomer group. One option will be to join someone from our care team if you would like to share more personally and deeply about whatever is on your heart. One group will be led by me and we will be talking about cancel culture. And another group will be led by Mark Marnaka, our worship leader, about our fourth Unitarian Universalist principle. And finally, one group will just be for informal, unmoderated chit chat. If you have any trouble selecting your group, just stay here and we'll do our best to help you in a moment. And with that, go in resilience, growing in strength. Go finding balance in whatever ways that is possible this week. Go in peace, knowing that we embrace each other even now from a distance.